It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the CUNY Graduate Center today for the start of the Black Atlantic at 20 Symposium. Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Duncan Faraday and I'm the Director of American Studies here at the Graduate Center and the co-facilitator with Candace Chu of the Revolutionizing American Studies Initiative. I particularly want to thank you for joining us on behalf of the Advanced Research Collaborative, the sponsoring unit for this conference. Without the work and sustained support of Don Robotham and Alita Rojas, the driving forces behind ARC, none of this would be possible. It's also my pleasure to, to welcome you on behalf of the core group of faculty who've been working on framing this event and teaching courses linked to its aims and ambitions. So on behalf of my co-conspirators, Herman Bennett, Candace Chu, who refuses to be on stage, Robert Reed Farr, thank you all for being here today. It would really be impossible to quickly tell you how much pleasure and intellectual energy I receive from being able to collaborate with the three of them. So I'll simply say that what I admire most about Herman, Candace, and Robert is that each of them always carries a small ax with them wherever they go. <laughs> and it is always invigorating to be swinging alongside them. Indeed, I'm profoundly, profoundly grateful to each of them for their comradeship. To work with them is to truly understand what it means to participate in the life of the mind in the heart of the city. Before we begin, I want to thank a number of people, each of whom played a crucial role in the development of this conference. First and foremost, a heartfelt thanks to Bill Kelly, the Chancellor of the City University of New York. When I first approached Bill, who was then president of the Graduate Center with the idea for this event, before I finished, his words were, absolutely, whatever you need. Almost as quickly, he added, as long as you make this about our students. I think I speak for everyone up here today when I say how grateful we are for Bill's leadership and his intellectual vision, and note how much we all miss seeing him in our hallways. Thanks as well to our current interim president, Chase Robinson and his staff for their tireless support. Double thanks to Provost Louise Lenahan, who works harder than anyone else I know to make sure that the educational mission of this institution is the North Star that guides us in all of our endeavors. Special thanks again to Don Robotham and Alita Rojas of ARC for underwriting our efforts and doing everything they can to ease the burden of organizing and planning. Without the efforts of Z. Dempster, the Assistant Director for the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean, the symposium would never have gotten off the ground. I don't, is, she, is Z here? She maybe decided not to, she's probably doing more work on our behalf now. Uh, so just a, a thank you to Z. Thanks as well to Evan Sweeney, Kendra Sullivan, Sam Starkweather of the Center for Humanities, Chris Ang, Margaret Nasir, Tanya Foster, Ryan Mayan Hamilton, and Chelsea Shields, Jennifer Morgan, and Tavia Nyong'o. I also want to officially welcome Paul Gilroy to the Graduate Center. Obviously, without his groundbreaking work, groundbreaking work 20 years ago, we wouldn't be gathered here today. So welcome, Paul. Our deep thanks as well to Tina Kemp, Stefan Pialmier, Eric Lott for agreeing to take part in our programming and for sharing their reflections on the BA at 20 with us tomorrow. Forgive the lengthy thank yous, but it truly takes a village to plan a conference. So without further delay, I'd like to turn now to the subject of the session of the symposium. The title for this roundtable is In the Wake of the Black Atlantic, Pedagogy and Practice. We wanted to highlight from the outset the relationship between Gilroy's book and issues of pedagogy in order to essentially mirror Gilroy's own framing of his project in his preface. The Black Atlantic, Gilroy writes, grew out of his, quote, uneven attempts to show his students in a large introductory course on sociology at the South Bank Polytechnic in London, quote, that the experiences of black people were part of the abstract modernity they found so puzzling 
and to produce evidence some of the things that black intellectuals had said, sometimes as defenders of the West, sometimes as its sharpest critics, about their sense of embeddedness in the modern world. In conceiving of this part of the program, we asked our six distinguished panelists to offer some brief remarks that address the impact of the Black Atlantic and the issues and the arguments it offers in the particular fields in which they work. It is our hope that such a prompt will allow us to engage with the project of reflecting on the significance of Gilroy's work and attendant issues, but also to engage with each other across the various programs and units in the Graduate Center. So after each of our panelists speaks today, we hope that they will have a chance to begin to think we that we will all have a chance to begin to think collectively about how the Black Atlantic may offer us a generative model for new ways of thinking about disciplinarity and pedagogical praxis. Quite honestly, the most difficult part of organizing this conference was having to limit the number of people up on the stage today. So apologies to Gary Wilder, Uday Mehta, Claire Bishop, Anthony Alessandrini, Megan Vaughn, and Candace, and a host of others, all of whom would have probing things to say on this topic. And it's a delight to have them all as colleagues. So even before we actually begin, I wanna say we have to do this again soon. In lieu of lengthy introductions, I'm just gonna briefly name my six colleagues here in the order in which they will speak. First is Herman Bennett, who's professor of history at the Graduate Center. Jacqueline Nessie Brown is associate professor of anthropology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center. Susan Buck Morris is Professor of Political Science at the Graduate Center. Sujatha Fernandez is Associate Professor of Sociology at Queen Col Queens College and the Graduate Center. Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, who returned earlier this week from sabbatical from Europe just for this event. <laughs> Last night. Last night. <laughs> is Professor of Geography and American Studies here at the Graduate Center. Last and far from least, Robert Reed Farr is distinguished professor and president, sorry, distinguished and presidential professor of English and American Studies at the Graduate Center. So welcome and thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> thank you, Duncan. And thank you, Candace. Um, there's a lot of labor that went into this. So I want to thank all of the people um, that contributed to this. <coughs> and I want to make it very clear that um, each and every one of you in this room could actually be up here. Um, we have a lot to say. You have a lot to say on what's going to happen in the next two days. And I just have to say that looking at the folks in this audience, an amazing group of, an amazing assemblage of folks here. Some of the smartest people I've ever encountered and that, you know, I just looking at all these amazing graduate students that I've had the fortune to engage with um, who kick my butt every day I walk into this building. All right. <laughs> Quite literally, every that's day. Not, every that's day. not my problem. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> Duncan and Candace said that, uh, and Robert said, we have eight minutes, and so I'm going to be very precise about what I have to say in eight minutes. In the middle of the 20th century, the American anthropologist Melville Herskowitz reframed our approach to the African past. In, in asserting the obvious, slaves came from African cultural context, Herskowitz challenged the myth of the Negro past, thereby delineating a new framework through which subsequent writers represented the African diaspora. In questioning racist and racialized myths that then informed the New World Black experience, Herskovitz crafted a cultural framework for discerning how structures and agency engendered black cultures throughout the Americas. Explicitly challenging the dominant evolutionary paradigms that characterized Africans merely as racialized beings, Herskovitz, building on the work of his advisor, Franz Boas, inaugurated a shift from race to culture in representing how Africans navigated their experiences in the Americas. Another way of expressing the aforementioned is as follows. Through the influence of Herskovitz, the African diaspora largely assumed shape around the concept of culture. A new myth of the Negro past arose that then confined the experiences of blackness to the realm of culture. 
So here we were, a people engaged in centuries of abstracted cultural survival, abstracted because the modern cultural norms or cultural forms were no longer anchored in institutional mechanisms or state practices. Herskovitz, in fact, disavowed an engagement with power in his studies of the Negro past. So blackness reflected cultural practices as opposed to a theorization of power. The black Atlantic, double consciousness and modernity entered the crucible of culture and immediately reconfigured the intellectual landscape for scholars of slavery and post-emancipation societies. Professor Gilroy's insistence that we see slavery and blackness as constitutive features of our political modernity engendered the emergence of a new theorization of culture that eschews rooting the subjectivities of slaves solely in the materialist categories derived from labor or racial subordination. It introduced a fundamentally new grammar and lexicon for conceiving of blackness. Here was a book that positioned cultural experiences and cultural expressions as manifestations of the political that were simultaneously in dialogue with the Enlightenment and the project of modernity. Now, and due to the intervention of the Black Atlantic, writers acknowledged that social claims characterized the experiences of the enslaved. Still, the insistence that we grapple with subjectivities, not just cultural identities, did not dislodge the foundational concerns of black studies. What cultural logic informs the, the experiences or the black experience in the West? But rather re than ren render this musing as antiquated, we need to acknowledge that this query continues to constitute a political response to deeply held views that Africans and their New World descendants <coughs> represented a people without history. Indeed, there is more than reconstructive labor at stake. Simply put, engaging the African cultural past in the new world and old underscores the political nature of representation either in the guise of scholarly inquiry, disciplinary formation, and social memory. In this respect, writing about African cultures in the West continues to be embedded in what, anthropo what the anthropologist Melville Herskovitz termed the myth of the Negro past, yet in the wake of the Black Atlantic, we, we now see how the myth is foundational to the very making of the West. Indeed, our, in, instead of believing that our engagements with the African past can transcend the minefield of political representation, we need to acknowledge it and our complicity in its politics. Students of the Afro-Latin American past, for instance, confront at least two related forms of death in crafting their subjects, their subjects' history, um, crafting their subjects' history um, around social death, the experiential state among survivors of the Middle Passage, and civil death, whose colonial and post-colonial legacies are manifest in a nationalist disavowal of the black experiences as the subject of inquiry. Given the importance of Spanish America's African past, even beyond the canonical site of blackness, that is Cuba, and its, in its ontology and death, we simply should characterize the act of disavowing the black experience on the part of Spanish American intellectuals and intellectuals of Spanish America as a form of epistemological exorcism. In having said as much in relationship to a distinct terrain of inquiry, Professor Gilroy's, Professor Gilroy's Black Atlantic clarified how our engagement or lack thereof with the past reflected a politics and a set of positions. 20 years ago, the Black Atlantic dared us to conceive of a history of African-European interaction that pressed beyond the inherited conceptual legacies framing popular and scholarly depictions of that past. My debt to the Black Atlantic is clear. In the wake of an early modern expansion and its encounters with distinct social collectivities, sovereign and subject, espanol and bozal, master and slave, a novel concept, the individual, events liberty, a nascent social state that gained expression through the lived experiences of Africans and their offspring. In relation to the slave and slavery, liberty requires little explanation. The same cannot be said for private lives, conceived through hierarchies framed by patriarch and slave, husband and wife, alongside father and child, mother and child, Liberty emerged from the very dualities that engendered another social phenomenon, private life. As the master's property, writers in the past and present asserted that, enslaved, that the enslaved did not will the legally sanctioned existence independent of their owners. If slaves manifested a private life, masters allegedly willed it. But after reading and teaching the Black Atlantic just weeks after I returned from the Mexican archives 20 years ago, 
It launched me on a wholesale rethinking of slavery and freedom. I had mined the archives for cultural material and the tradition in, in the tradition of Herskovitz, but now wanted to pursue the primal history of the slave. What I find thinking through the Black Atlantic was that even as civil law sanctioned the master's dominion over chattel, canon law simultaneously upheld the slave's personhood. By subjecting converted Africans and the blacks to the law, the Catholic Church, the canon law brought a category of the private domestic privacy into existence among the enslaved, which Africans and their descendants quickly mobilized to their advantage. Almost immediately, they made legal personhood their own. In the earliest years of Spanish rule, here I'm thinking about the 16th century, I'm talking about the 16th century, in particular areas where Catholic authority prevailed, Africans and blacks maintained private lives, framed around their legally recognized subjectivities as husbands and wives, parents and legal minors, ch chaste virgins and grandparents, categories at odds with the master's will and Roman civil law. In writing about the private lives of black, I was not intent on revisiting the intellectual terrain of resilience and cultural survival that was brilliantly yet problematically framed by an earlier generation of scholars writing in the wake of Herskovitz about black life, slave and free. An examination of private lives brought into relief institutional, jurisdictional, and imperial claims alongside political traditions that hadn't acted and shaped the very formalities of the early modern African-European encounter, far beyond the trope of racial subordination and, disp and dispossession. As an explicit legacy of the Black Atlantic, this, perspe this perspective, political in nature, offered a fundamentally new horizon of emplotment. Thank you. I think I'd prefer to sit, if you don't mind. I'd like to thank Herman for taking on Herskovitz. Um, as an anthropologist, uh, I thought that was my duty, and some of my anthropological colleagues insisted that my first page has to be about Herskovitz, and Herskovitz doesn't appear in here, so thank you for, yeah. <laughs> for doing that. To assess, however cursorily, the impact of the Black Atlantic on anthropology, we have to know what was happening in the discipline when the book was published. In 1993, there was a body of anthropological scholarship that was explicitly framed as Atlanticist, centering most famously around religion, history, and political economy. Some of this work sought to theorize contemporary black cultures in the Americas by linking them to their roots both in slavery and in Africa before that. Within this project, scholars deployed a series of related concepts, creolization, syncretism, continuity, and or creativity, to situate Atlantic cultures historically. A landmark departure from those concerns lay in the very influential book, Nations Unbound, published at basically the same time as the Black Atlantic. That text argued for a transnational approach to the study of Caribbean people in the context of immigration and used the term diaspora as a way of thinking about the dual loyalties of trans migrants. Two related developments in this period also need to be mentioned briefly. First, anthropology and related disciplines were absorbed in conversations about globalization and transnationalism. And second, I think it's fair to say that anthropology was still grappling with postmodernist critiques of culture. Many anthropologists were actively and excitedly, perhaps somewhat anxiously, rethinking the discipline's key term. Enter the Black Atlantic, which established a productive tension between, on the one hand, a notion of continuity of black cultural formations across time and space, with its anti-anti-essentialist notion of the changing same, while on the other hand, emphasizing the routes of cultural identity and the hybridity of culture itself. In this regard, I would say that the touchstones of its contribution to anthropology are found in these latter formulations. With critiques unfolding within anthropology for its sometime treatment of culture as thing-like, a critique that certainly affected the discourse on creolization, for example, the notion of a changing same black culture was not likely to be taken up as much as the more open-ended and fluid frameworks represented by an examination of the travels of cultural materials, whether they be people, ideologies, or musics, or whatever and in the hybrid nature of culture identity, cultural identities and culture itself. Moreover, unlike the Atlanticist project in anthropology, which had been proffering comparative analyses between black cultures, the Black Atlantic developed an argument about the connections between them, the accent again being on intercultural exchanges within a single social space. 
Notwithstanding the countless citations on these very particular matters, I would argue in a broader spirit that the most conspicuous impact of Paul's work on anthropology has been in completely rerouting the study of diaspora. Of course, this impact has been felt across the disciplines, not just in anthropology, and it has affected not only black diasporic scholarship, but di diaspora studies writ large. The study of diaspora as a contemporary cultural and political phenomenon is simply inconceivable without Paul's intervention. But that's arguably because of his first book, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack. While The Black Atlantic is, of course, more far-reaching in scope than the prior book, The Black Atlantic was more modest, in my opinion, in its theorization of diaspora. There Ain't No Black, and here one might also add the essays collected in small acts, made the greater contribution to rethinking diaspora, despite the fact that the Black Atlantic tends to get all the love. <laughs> in order to appreciate the contribution of There Ain't No Black, one must first consider what has made the Black Atlantic difficult to think with from an anthropological point of view. Its method for proving its point about the hybridity of black cultures consists largely in his study of the works, lives, and travels of a select few black American luminaries. Anthropologists, by contrast, <coughs> uh, deal with everyday people. The Black Atlantic rethinks modernity by periodizing it through slavery and posits this as the framework within and against which black cultures were formed and continue to unfold. Anthropologists work without, uh, while impossible without history and while also crucially concerned with the arising origins, is really about the everyday. Along similar lines, the Black Atlantic examines the production of culture without reference to its material basis, particularly in reference to global capitalism, a move that has generated some critical comment among anthropologists. In all of these respects, there ain't no black invited more anthropological engagement. I repeat, even though the Black Atlantic is the more cited text on diaspora, those citations may be misplaced. They're, they rightfully belong to there ain't no black. The Black Atlantic, as I just suggested, entered into a set of discussions that were already ongoing in anthropology. But arguably, it was there ain't no black that provided a crucial and early spark to those very discussions. When, in 1987, that book's diaspora chapter presented black Britons both accessing and refashioning reggae and soul musics from Jamaican and black American communities of protest, indeed remixing these forms with the aid of Cockney translations, and all of this analyzed within a culturally grounded and historically spe specific critique of capitalism, nothing like this existed. Africa, became, uh, Africa came uh, briefly to life in the text, not as a site of originary culture, Black suffering at the hands of the apartheid regime was posited as an object of black British political concern. These kinds of issues and forces in which everyday black people saw themselves connected to blacks elsewhere, this was now diaspora. The focus of There Ain't No Black was moreover an actual tangible community that we were able to engage on terms that were, if not ethnographic, at least ethnographic-y. The stakes of different, different political economic analyses and approaches in the understanding of this community with its particular national, within its particular national historical context were also laid out. We were also invited to consider everyday forms of cultural representation in terms of how they variously constituted race and nation, affecting the belonging of black Britons in the process. In anthropological terms, there was nothing not to love. Most, if not all, of the factors that inhibited anthropologists' full engagement with the Black Atlantic had already been accounted for in the previous text, which could be productively considered as prequel. Yet, because it is the Black Atlantic whose influence we are here to examine, and which I love, please make no mistake, I should offer some indication of how productive that text has been in anthropology. The explicit marking and theorization of Black America's global influence in the sphere of cultural production, especially hip-hop, has exploded. Many of us have critically analyzed that very hegemony, including its gendering. There is now a veritable anthropology of global blackness, one in which radical and perhaps not so radical political cultures and subjectivities are seen as emerging through particular forms and moments of transnational connection. Along similar lines, the explicit rendering of black cultures in oceanic terms lent a special urgency to anthropology's engagement with geography, manifesting not only in our studies of globalization, but also our studies of the spatial constitution of racialized formations of culture and power. If not inspired by Paul's work, then at the very least emboldened by it, Atlanticist anthropology now is framed in specifically dialogic terms so that the grand assemblages of Africa and the Americas can be seen as existing in a coeval relation rather than a sequential one. This dialogic school tends not to deal with Europe or black Europe, alas, although it does very much engage Afro-Latin worlds. Moreover, the Black Atlantic inspired many Africanist anthropologists who, over the past 20 years, have identified the myriad ways that diaspora blacks and traveling Africans have inspired hybridized cultural productions on the continent. This large and growing body of anthropological scholarship can only be described as super exciting. 
The Black Atlantic's focus on modernity from the point of view of the slave also contributed to its treatment in anthropology, that is modernity's treatment, which has likewise studied modernity from the perspective of the subjects whom it both constitutes and marginalizes. Of course, his focus on Western modernity, notwithstanding his analysis of his counter discourses and countercultures, inspired some pushback from anthropologists who, anthropologists who lobbied for more attention to alternative modernities emerging elsewhere. Uh, most famously, this uh, position comes from Iwa Ong, but there are others. Funnily enough, I read somewhere that if Paul had it to do over again, he wouldn't take the book, make the book about modernity at all. <laughs> in closing, allow me to suggest that one consistent element of Paul's work that I wish received more attention in anthropology um, is its positing of the quest for emancipation, autonomy, and citizenship as the touchstone of black political subjectivity in the black Atlantic world. To the considerable extent that we understand our work to relate broadly to social justice, such a focus becomes highly relevant, especially as it relates to one of the greatest moral crises of our time, one that originates in the immediate post-slavery period, and that is the criminalization and mass incarceration of black people who are otherwise known as lesser breeds without the law. Thank you. That was great, and I think it's really important to mention there ain't no black in the Union Jack because that was a, a politically inflammatory uh, intervention into the public sphere uh, that was not uh, susceptible to a certain kind of institutionalization, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to read notes, um, and I uh, thought that would be a nice uh, moment in between, but I, I don't want you to think that uh, I haven't thought about this a long time. We had a meeting last week when we discussed uh, uh, inter, in an interdisciplinary setting at the uh, Committee for Globalization and Social Change uh, how we all felt personally about the book, and uh, that in itself was enlightening. And also I want to try to uh, tie this event, which is really a fantastic event, and uh, the energy in this room is terrific. Um, to what the title of uh, this, this initiative is uh, that Duncan and Candice have, have uh, started with, with uh, uh, you were involved in it at, as well uh, at the very beginning, I think. Uh, um, so I'm not sure who, I, I, I know that the people who have been writing me have been Candace and, uh, and <laughs> Duncan, so I don't know who I'm leaving out here of the people, but those are the ones who have been sending the emails, so they're going to get the credit right here. Uh, but Bennett has and other people as well. The point is that this, uh, this uh, initiative is part of revolutionizing American studies, and that's the part that connects to teaching and teaching here at the Graduate Center, which is just a very, very exciting place to be and is becoming more exciting with uh, every, every year that uh, I know it better. Uh, it's just a fantastic place because it's the kind of place that, that can take a book like Paul's and make it, uh, um, and I'm talking now about all of them, but let's just say Black Atlantic because that's what we're celebrating today, and make it part of all of our work. It's not limited to uh, uh, one particular field, and that's what's so important, it seems to me, about it. Um, what I want to say is uh, about what can happen even to a very... Um, revolutionary book inside of the academy and what I think has to be fought against. Uh, okay, so there were concepts that most of them have been mentioned already here that were really transformed by Paul's work. Uh, concepts like culture, like blackness, like diaspora, and I would say modernity. I wouldn't want to drop that because I think it was transformed to the degree that we can allow it to stick around. Um, and so these terms actually were transformed, but with the discussion of the book, and I'm talking now for um, some um, background work that I did preparing for this, was to read some of the critiques that have been done of this book, and I thought, oh, can't we do better than the academy? A lot of the academic stuff, I think, is, is, not, is missing the really revolutionary uh, uh, spirit that, that, uh, that is in that book. And I'm talking about certain dangers that happen in the academy. The first one I would call assimilation. That's when somehow or other even a very radical text can be brought into the canon 
which is a good thing, of course, but into the canon in such a way that the canonicity sort of overtakes it, and it uh, then suffers a second problem, which is depoliticization. Uh, and I know we've all, we know what I'm talking about if we've been uh, uh, in the academic world for any length of time. Um, even the most radical ideas can somehow become just, you know, okay, Gilroy has this take, what is it? Let's memorize it and put it in a box and put it over here or over there or whatever. Another, of course, is ghettoization. And of course, it's hard with Paul's book because it's precisely uh, about a blackness that spills out of every uh, boundary that one could imagine. Um, uh, but uh, these are dangers that can occur. And it seems to me that some of the uh, critical uh, writing on the book in the last 20 years has been um, about turf wars in the academy, which seems to me to be a very meager politics indeed. Um, okay, the next thing I want to talk about is a kind of just academization, which tends to be a trivialization of ideas, right? Which is that it's not about politics in the academy. It is about that too. It came out of an experience of teaching, of teaching a certain kind of student at a certain time in history. So it came out of Paul's experience, an experience that was not his alone, but an experience of a generation. And that um, uh, leads me to uh, a way I think uh, these kinds of texts can keep their radical edge. And that is if they're understood first to come out of that particular experience, but by, by doing that kind of uh, contextualization, I do not mean a kind of historicizing that would dismiss a text, quite the contrary. The truth of a text includes the, the political reality in which it emerged. And that truth uh, uh, is at, at best, at the best readings of the text, still visible within it. Um, I also want to dig up a word from another uh, writer who is very much in danger of becoming canonized, assimilated, um, depoliticized, and academicized, and that is Walter Benjamin. Uh, it's a term that he uses uh, in his philosophy of history, and it is constellations. Um, it seems to me extremely useful. Um, I, I've, I find it useful in my own work, and I think it's useful in this case, too. What it means is that the present moment doesn't relativize a text. And I mean now we have three moments, right? We have the moment of the slave trade itself. We have the moment of Paul's writing about this at a particular time when the contemporary politics was precisely uh, uh, embedded in a book like There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, right? And there, was, uh, and there is also our moment. Right? And these moments, these historical moments, make a kind of constellation in which it seems to me um, history has to keep relevant inside of the discussion of a text. So um, I'm calling for that. And what is the experience uh, of our generation? Uh, it is one where, um, at least at the Graduate Center, now I'm going to talk about my own experience here at the Graduate Center as someone in, in, involved in very interdisciplinary work. Uh, and that is that um, there's something that people in many contexts call the disciplinary police. And these police are really dangerous, and if you find them, you should, you know, they have something worse than mustard gas, and it is essentially uh, the ability to put up boundaries to what you, as a graduate student, I'm talking to, I think, a lot of people in this room, or any of us who are involved in academics, what we can and cannot do. Right? And this kind of policing can take several forms. One is, uh, and, and this, again, I saw in some of the uh, critical discussions of uh, Black Atlantic, you know, is it post-colonial, or is it post-modern, or is it post-Marxist, or is it cultural studies? I mean, let's put it in a pigeonhole. Let's get rid of what's ever uncomfortable about it and stick it someplace where we can, you know, say it's like everything else, and we don't have to deal with it. So that would be one danger, right, that comes with disciplinary policing. Um, and another is, of course, a methodological one, which says that um, what a discipline is about is a fight about method, as if method and content could ever be separated. I don't believe they can. And the third one has to do with, um, yeah, what are you allowed to talk about, right? If you're a sociologist, right, can you speak about 
you know, something that is not normally seen as part of the terrain of sociology. This, I think, is totally important when it comes to designing research questions that your dissertation is going to resolve. You know, I've, I've heard it, I've heard it at Cornell quite a bit, where people would have a research question and they already had all mapped out how they were gonna answer their question. And I said, well, what happens if you find out that you need to know something that's not in political science? And they'd say, well, I changed the question. No, no, you change the boundary, right? You don't cut off something just because you hit the boundary of a discipline. Um, and so those are the kinds of policing um, strategies that Paul just never paid any attention to, I think, ever, Paul. I don't think that's your style. But what, it, what happened for me was then that I had the opportunity, uh, knowing that book, to feel like you know it was just my intellectual climate. And I speak, I, I'm sure, for a lot of people who read the book when it first came out. It's part of the intellectual air that I breathe. And so it gave me, for instance, personally, the license to write Hegel and Haiti, even though Hegel and Haiti were not supposed to get, go together at all, right? So uh, that uh, uh, leads me to my last comment, which is, uh, for me, it was the air I breathe. But for one person whose name has actually been mentioned, and I told her I was gonna quote her, so she knows that she's at a conference in Portland, um, and so uh, it's Claire Bishop, who uh, is one of our colleagues in art history, who is also in the Globalization Committee on the board, as, as, as are many, many people in, involved here. Um, and it, I, it was interesting because she kept her mouth uh, quiet for the uh, couple of hours that we met uh, last week when we were discussing this book. And uh, she did because she had never read the book before. And so at the very end, Gary Wilder, fortunately asked her, well, what did you think, Claire? And Claire said, well, you know, I hadn't ever read it before. And she said, and I saw it in the very, I mean, I, I read it just now in the context of having seen the new movie, 12 Years a Slave. And she said it was really just striking, right? So I'm going to, so then I thought, but then I had to leave and it was the end of the time and I never found out what she said, but I sent her an email and said, what did you mean? What, what struck you about it? Because here you are coming to it cold from a field that's not the field of people who normally read that book. And she sent me an email and she's so articulate that, you know, this is the one thing I can read because it's actually wonderful English. And uh, I told her I was gonna do this. I'm just gonna end by uh, saying three things that she said to me in that email. Uh, and this, I think, is such a tribute to the book. It made me want to produce the kind of work that also puts events and histories into juxtaposition in ways that challenge established taxonomies and disciplinary proprieties. As a secondary effect of this, his rejection of ethnocentrism also gave me access to black history in an inclusive way. She isn't black herself, right? It, it's writing that looks beyond saints and sinners and that doesn't leave you feeling incapacitated in the face of this appalling history. The other main point that I took away from it was the intriguing stuff about music, transfiguration, and utopia. I had never thought of slave songs as political resistance and critical counterculture and moreover offering a counter argument to the enlightenment division of aesthetics, ethics, and politics. It's an amazing line of thought. The proposition at the end of chapter one about aesthetic expression as self-fashioning and communal liberation also seemed to offer an important alternative to the ideas of art as imminent, that is the kind of thing that Adorno would criticize as expressing somehow what's already there rather than uh, as being a form of resistance itself. And then she said, 12 years a slave, not sure I can make more of a link with Black Atlantic than the obvious, but what the film achieves what you also get from the book is remind you of the way in which this is not just a Southern problem, but an entire transatlantic system. Plantation owners don't own their slaves. The banks do, and the banks are in the UK. Thank you. Um, 
I'm also going to sit down, if that's okay. And thank you, um, Susan, it was a perfect transition with the last comment about music, because that is what I'm going to be discussing today. And so just to, to quickly say, though, before I launch into this, um, also thank you to Candice and to Duncan and to everybody who's organized this, this conference, this very important conference. Um, so for uh, Paul Gilroy, music has always held a privileged space in the Black Atlantic and has unseated the primacy of language and writing as expressive forms. So it's no surprise that this model has had a major impact in the scholarship and thinking about hip hop culture, particularly for people like myself who work on global hip hop. Much like the hip hop ambassadors from Africa Bambada, Fab Five Freddy and Paris, to Chuck D of Public Enemy who traveled the world sharing ideas, new techniques and equipment of the culture they had pioneered, I see Gilroy also as an ambassador who gave us the tools and techniques for thinking about new forms of global solidarity and exchange, always strongly grounded in a politics of anti-racism and a desire for social justice. He made us feel much like those global hip hop audiences in France, Cuba or Ghana who were blown away by what they were seeing and who went on to build their own work based on what they learnt. And, and today, this is what I want to talk a little bit about, about how um, the techniques and the ideas and the tools uh, given to us in the Black Atlantic are things that have been the basis for my own work. In the intervening years since the Black Atlantic was published, within the field of hip-hop studies, there have been two main reactions. Um, and it's really interesting that those reactions mirror a little bit the, the divisions that, that Gilroy himself signaled in his test and, and, and in some ways had already preempted. Um, one of these reactions was from scholars like George Lipsitz, who sought to expand the concept of the Black Atlantic to include non-black subjects, and to think about those in the housing projects, barrios, and peripheries of urban metropolises worldwide who might also feel some connection with, with this culture. The other uh, response came from the hip hop scholar Imani Perry and other African American scholars who argued that the concept of the black Atlantic distracts us from the black American situatedness of forms like hip hop and that despite their culturing, cultural borrowings and hybridity are black American cultural products that relied heavily on black American aesthetics. Perry argues further that in contrast to the notion of a shared political and aesthetic culture, the interaction between people of African descent in the New World is highly conflictual. She argues that the Black Atlantic model underestimates the depth of national identifications, and she points to the one-way flow of American hip-hop culture to the world due to the power of US global domination. She concludes her assessment of the Black Atlantic this way, quote, the post-colonial Afro-Atlantic hip-hop community is, unfortunately in many ways, a fantastic aspiration rather than a reality. I've seen this kind of what, what Perry calls romantic Afro-Atlanticism at play in my own research on global hip hop. And I think that Gilroy himself acknowledges it when he talks about, quote, the heavily mythologized pan-African ideology produced by black America. So I wanna give one example of this. I wanna give a few vignettes from my own field research and, and to sort of demonstrate some of these ideas. So one of the examples that comes to mind when thinking about this kind of romantic Afro-Atlanticism was the 1999 annual Cuban hip hop festival in Alamar. It's a town on the outskirts of Havana. And the American rap group Dead Prez was there and they were rapping, I'm an African, I'm an African, before a crowd of thousands. And the whole amphitheater was resounding with the Cubans who were chanting back the words. It was pan-Africanism in motion. But the politics didn't always translate. Unaware of the implications of what he was doing, the rapper M1 pulled out a dollar bill and started to burn it with a lighter an act which in the US is considered illegal and a defacement of private property. Because of this dollar, the children in my country are dying for drugs or for crack or for bling, he said. The audience went wild. They didn't understand how he could be burning a precious dollar bill. People began to call out, give me that dollar, I can buy some bread or some French fries. <laughs> then he began to burn a $10 bill. No, stop! The audience was screaming. What is that crazy lunatic doing? I could feed my whole family for a month with that. One of the members of the American delegation, Raquel Rivera, was translating, trying to explain to the baffled audience that in America, black people are dying because of the dollar bill. But here in Cuba, shouted out one person half seriously, 
people are dying of hunger. So I agree with Perry that the Black Atlantic is a fantasy, but, and this is where I differ from her, I think it is a productive fantasy that even if it doesn't exist in reality, has been deployed by hip hoppers around the globe to give power to their localized movements. The imagining of transnational alliances, as conflictual and as transient as those may be, has given diverse actors the resources and the platform to tell their stories, and it has provided the grounds for their locally based political actions. Another vignette is a year after 9-11 had happened, I was at a Cuban rap concert in a local Casa de la, de la Cultura, or a local culture house, and the Cuban rap group Anonimo Consejo was performing a song entitled, No War, No Blood, Peace Now. The lyrics to the song were very much the same discourse as Fidel Castro had, had been giving in speeches, and really what you could find in the major news media in Cuba, no to war and imperialism, Afghanistan as a, ca as a casualty of the war on terror, and it was clear that these rappers took inspiration from the Cuban Revolution and from Fidel himself, even as they were reworking some of these ideals. But the main artist of Anonimo Consejo had also just changed his name to Sekoa Umoja to emphasize his spiritual connections with Africa. At the concert, he also gave a fiery speech about race and the importance of race over the kind of humanism represented by people like Jose Martí. It was this imagined connection to Africa that kept the rappers outside the orbit of the state, even as they continued to collaborate with it. It was their ties with French record labels, American rappers, and with black celebrities like Danny Glover and Harry Belafonte that gave Cuban rappers some level of recognition with their society. Finally, I want to close with one last image that sort of bring this, brings us all back to myself um, as a young person sitting in the garage of my friend Khaled Sabsabi, who was a Lebanese hip hop producer in Sydney's West, whose family had fled the Civil War back home and they had come to settle in Sydney. He was making a beat for a song written by my other friend, an Aboriginal artist called Wyatta Telfa, called Fuck the Brady Bunch. <laughs> Khaled had one of these really old, thick plastic gray EPS machines that they used to use for making beats. And after adding in some drum samples and a, and a funky bass line, he took out the album Superbad by Terminator X of Public Enemy. From one of the tracks, he took out Sister Soldier's battle cry, We Are At War, and he added it to the beginning of the beat and to the end. In this act of beat making and music making and sampling, there were two global flows present. There was the, the saccharine sweet romance of white suburbia as represented by the Brady Bunch that we all grew up watching in Australia, and the other, a powerful counterforce rivaling the hegemonic power of the Brady Bunch and giving voice to other histories of exile, displacement, and poverty, and that was the black planet of public enemy. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good, all right. It's nice to be back in the building for a minute and um, absolutely sublime to participate in this um, consideration and celebration of the Black Atlantic by my dear, dear friend, Paul Gilroy. And it's also really intimidating to stand up here and talk about your work. So here we go. I'm going to talk about being a geographer. I became a geographer. I started becoming a geographer when this book came out. I started uh, my PhD at Rutgers in September of 1993. And in October, about October 24th, 1993, I have the bill, the book arrived at my house. And I read it to shreds, as you can see. These are the original post-it notes. Um, and this book made it possible for me to understand the discipline on which I had embarked. I didn't realize when I became, started to become a geographer that geography was such an imperial discipline. I didn't understand when I started to become a geographer that so many people who practice that discipline work for the military. I didn't understand <laughs> when I started to become a geographer that many geographers were only concerned about something they called aerial differentiation, and it took me at least three weeks in geography school to understand that they meant aerial as in space and not aerial as in, in the air. 
So geography made sense to me because I had read Paul's work, but before that I'd read his earlier work, of course, There Ain't No Black, I'd read Stuart Hall, Cedric Robinson, C.L.R. James, Selma James, Claudia Jones, Hazel Carby, many other people. Um, but I still didn't quite get it until the Black Atlantic came into my lap. In particular, the study of race in the discipline of geography tended to follow, and indeed today still tends to follow, uh, a pattern that was just recently and very usefully described by Hal Foster in his critique of aesthetic philosophers. So he says, they tend to fix on one moment or one model of artistic practice, to ontologize it as art as such, and then to use this reified token for their own conceptual schemes. And I thought this is exactly what so much of the study of race in many disciplines, but particularly geography, um, looks like. So in the interest of not uh, ontologizing and then um, uh, making up a conceptual uh, scheme about this token, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book and then show you some pictures because geography is a, 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 a deeply visual, 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 visual discipline. And we cannot think unless we can see, which makes it tough for people who can't. Um, for me, freedom is modernity's central contradiction. I cannot arrive at any other conclusion. And by that, I do not mean the end of enslavement. Enslavement is one version of unfreedom, but rather the practice of making unbounded life. Um, the chaos and motion that set what we call modernity uh, into being is the chaos and motion out of which various people in various places in many combinations have tried to make sense. And the sense that it seems to me keeps making mo modernity happen has been the sense of what freedom is. In the Black Atlantic, theory is method. It is a way of thinking about how to work with what Paul calls a discontinuous tradition, or what we who are constantly raging against mass incarceration and the various forms of partition that make mass incarceration both possible and necessary, in scare quotes, is non-reformist reform. So the theory is a method, and the method is a way to think about thinking about making non-reformist reform. And the three key um, concepts for me that make non-reformist reform methodologically possible through my engagement with this work are, as other people have said earlier this evening, anti-anti-essentialist arguments, the concept of discontinuous tradition, and the key concepts of intercultural and transnational. And both of those words have become quite buzzy in recent years, and I think um, uh, to echo what Susan Buckmore said earlier, we ought to revive those words with meaning instead of assuming that they label something, some uh, concept that we can then scheme about. Um, this method then requires that we do certain things, uh, that we understand divisions as co-constitutive interdependencies. So we think partition as something that brings together rather than something that separates, that we consider ideology and culture as material forces, and that we center the region, uh, that we consider deeply and systematically the place-making practices of racial capitalism, including, including and especially political form, especially in the maelstrom of late 20th century globalizing capitalism to show to what end the planet has been colonized by the nation state, even as simultaneous neocolonial expansions overlay this strangely naturalized set of affiliations, institutions, and possibilities. So I think that is the challenge that this method presents to us as geographers or as people who are trying to change the world. But also importantly, if centering the region, let us call it the Black Atlantic, is part of the project that we've been um, challenged with, it also means that we think deeply about 
discontinuous regions. So we can think of the Atlantic as continuous, right? right? But there are discontinuous regions. And what underlies the idea of diaspora is the idea of understanding discontinuous regions, right? Understanding them as in some fundamental ways unified, but not unified through the notion of a mythic past, but rather through the activities of an ever extending behind us present. That means, when I was listening to Sujatha talk, that that fight over the dollar didn't necessarily prove division. It was the dollar that brought people together and their consideration of the different ways to think about the dollar that then maybe produced a new way of considering the diaspora rather than saying, no, that division between the nation states is what matters most. Um, the, one of the things that Black Atlantic does is to elaborate the structures of feeling that shape the Black Atlantic world. And a critique that I didn't realize until I reread the book recently that I completely internalized and thought was my own is... <laughs> 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 I really did. I'm really ashamed. So. Hopefully not in print. If you find it in print, you know, just put note, Gilroy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the critique of Raymond Williams, the useful, engaged critique, right? And the way that um, that Williams and 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 Gilroy, in his critique and his engagement with Williams, talks about structures of feeling, so that. What I had thought earlier was, oh, Raymond Williams, structures of feeling, he doesn't think about multiple structures of feeling, but still the concept is useful. And what this book does, of course, is to lay out the contradictory structures of feeling that are constitutive of the discontinuous tradition of the black Atlantic. Um, so structures of feeling then are not unitary for any time or place, but rather dialectical. Um, the whole discussion of Hegel and Douglas is the great example of that. And what I've been trying to write this year, and thank God I had to reread this book so I don't make a fool of myself, is um, a book that's called Fatal Couplings, and it's about what discontinuous tradition rests on. You know, I keep asking myself, how do we get back to it? Is it, only, is it merely the continuation of suffering that makes us keep on reinventing ways to undo it, or are there other things um, things other than suffering, and I have to believe that's so, that make this discontinuous tradition that uh, the set of traditions that make the Black Atlantic the Black Atlantic something that can persist. So that changing same rests on some sort of underlying capacity, right? There's something beneath that. And what I've been writing, and it's not done so I won't read it to you, is a, um, is a piece of a book in which I try to think about what the infrastructure of feeling is that underlies and makes possible the productivity, which is to say the usefulness of the structures of feeling that come into being from time to time. And I used, went back to Williams now, more modestly than before, to think about how Williams uh, discusses what he uh, makes of tradition. And he says, tradition is an accumulation of structures of feeling. But accumulation, and this is the key, he argues, is not something that just happens, right? Traditions don't accumulate by structures of feeling washing up on the shore like so much flotsam. But rather, he says, accumulation is the practice, and the practice is the selection and reselection of ancestors. And insofar as the Black Atlantic and the sort of body of work that many of us have pointed to this evening uh, brings to our consciousness who some of those ancestors are, not necessarily by name, like Du Bois, but also by practice, like the many sailors who, like Frederick Douglass, plied the waters of the world as sailors, making common cause with people around, then perhaps we can think about the possibility of that accumulation, right? what it is that makes it possible for us to select and reselect ancestors as something that I'm thinking of as the infrastructure of feeling. 
That helps me understand, for example, how it is that W.E.B. Du Bois came to see in the archives of Reconstruction that golden footnote in which he wrote, the experience of the Negro worker under Reconstruction provides the researcher the opportunity to study inductively the Marxian theory of the state. So Du Bois did not write the experience of the freed African under Reconstruction shows us an ancient African way of being in the world, right? And it's back and forth across the Atlantic, I think, in, in the metaphorical as well as the material sense and the various struggles that Du Bois went through, some of which are elaborated in the Black Atlantic, that made him see that archive in a way that he might not have seen it had he read it in 1890 instead of during the Great Depression. So now I'm going to show you these slides and then sit down. Um, uh, I started with the Brooks so that we can think about what the Black Atlantic is not, and the Black Atlantic is not the one-way transport of people against their will. And of course, Marcus Redeker is the person who wrote the most wonderful history and ethnography of the slave ship. And Paul writes about Turner's painting, um, uh, The Slave Ship, 1840, and writes about how Ruskin couldn't quite bring himself to say, this is a painting of people thrown overboard during a storm. Um, and I found this painting because I thought it would be nice to look at it, but I was also completely surprised, as I'll show you in a minute, by what has become of that painting over time. Um, another kind of view into thinking the Black Atlantic as an Atlantic, as this complete set of relationships that are constantly being remade and renewed, is to think about um, the, uh, the recent film Cuba and Af uh, 2006 film Cuban and Afri Cuba and African Odyssey. Um, that is a, an account of Cuba's uh, involvement in various anti-colonial revolutions in Africa with a special focus on Angola. And these are guys coming back to Cuba off that ship. But also to think about how writers with a really keen geographical imagination like Amitav Ghosh in his watery book, Sea of Poppies and the Second One, River of Smoke, has tried to figure out a way to give us a sense of the constant circulation and interconnection of people who we tend to think about completely in completely segregated ways. So there's just a passing reference in the beginning of Sea of Poppies to a sailor called Freddie Douglas. But, and this is like terrible, but let me approach the board. <laughs> All right. You see that painting up there on the wall? No. So it's supposed to be your living room. <laughs> and you're supposed to think about this painting that you can buy. It's that painting. So you can buy this painting, hand painted, for $89 today. Wow. They're mass produced, hand painted, um, somewhere in, at a place called Fine Art China. And those of you who have read the second um, volume of, the, of Gosha's trilogy know about the mass-produced mm -hmm. master's copies in, uh, in China uh, described in that book. Well, it turns out it's absolutely real and today, and you can get the painting um, today. The last thing I wanted to show is this. This is a photograph by my late uh, colleague, um, the great artist Alan Sakula. And Alan Sakula uh, wrote, uh, wrote, made several films as well as amazing installations with photography and sculpture and so on and so forth, trying to sort of come to some understanding and representable understanding of globalization and its you know, constant disruption and constant movement of people and things, which is to say the ongoing modernness of modernity. And so this is a, a, a cargo ship, as you can see, and I think it's plying the Pacific. And I know that Candace is teaching a course called the Black Pacific. And there is a new book out called Crossing the Bay of Bengal. And there are projects on the Black Indian Ocean, most notably people like Ned Alpers and uh, Francoise Vergès and others are working on. In short, the, the kind of thinking about the region, however it might be from time to time, 
you know, reduced to those sorts of concepts that Hal Foster so usefully described to us that I shared with you at the beginning of my remarks are happening. I don't know if it all originated with my friend Paul Gilroy's book, but I'm really thankful for that, that this book exists because it does give us the method that we can use to do our work. Thank you. Early in the Black Atlantic Modernity and Double Consciousness, Paul Gorey writes, regardless of their affiliation to the right, left, or center, groups have fallen back on the idea of cultural nationalism on the over-integrated conceptions of culture, which present immutable ethnic differences as an absolute break in the histories and experiences of black and white people. Against this choice stands another, more difficult option, the theorization of creolization metissage, mestizaje, and hybridity. From the viewpoint of ethnic absolutism, this would be a litany of pollution and impurity. It is the lovely and strangely compelling phrase, litany of pollution and impurity, that catches in my imagination as I find myself confronted with the question of whether in the wake of the Black Atlantic, it is possible to produce innovative work around race, colonization, cosmopolitanism, and imperialism, while also continuing to privilege traditional modes of intellectual inquiry? The answer is no. <laughs> um, traditional disciplines have been established through practices of exclusion and refusal, practices that are often so well-developed and rigid that they mitigate both against new forms of inquiry as well as the ability of the disciplines to maintain relevance within the contemporary cultures and societies that sustain them. Even more importantly, the theorization of creolization and mestizaje, that is to say the imagination of the profundity of the Atlantic, is by necessity a dirty affair, one that forces intellectuals to recalibrate their methods and methodologies in order to gain access to those locations that have been excluded from, one is wont to say, um, excreted from, um, the over-integrated conceptions of culture that Gilbert bemoans. Or to rush to what I take to be the punchline of my comments, the project that Gilroy initiated with the 1993 publication of The Black Atlantic is domesticated and deracinated to the extent that we overprivilege those subjects who are most readily visible, most easily available for analysis within the disciplines. In the study of language and literature, the English language and literature. It is a simple procedure for scholars to point to Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Chester Himes, Claude McKay, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, and Nella Larson, among others, in an effort to demonstrate the Pan-Africanism and cosmopolitanism of the African-American intellectual class. The problem, however, is that class has self-consciously established itself in contradistinction to statelessness, homelessness, and lack of discernible culture. With obvious exceptions, the African-American intellectual is in fact at home in America. The exigencies of forced travel, of necessary and everyday improvisation represent only a limited portion of his experience. Thus, even in especially the Middle Passage, presumably the founding moment in the establishment of the African-American people is very often perhaps most often narrated as unimaginable. Indeed, it is stunning how little consideration has been given to enslaved Africans in passage within our various attempts to theorize modernity. The intellectual and theoretical protocols on which we rely make it exceedingly difficult to view slaves in transit as anything other than the inert, anthropomorphic, but not exactly human products that they were advertised to be by their captors. While one might celebrate the work of an exceptional ex-slave such as Alada Equiano, it is rare that enslaved Africans on board ship or at market are ever regarded as specifically and indeed quintessentially modern subjects. Irritated and somewhat stunned by this reality, I've turned in my own teaching and writing towards those contemporary theorists and philosophers whose work helps me to grasp the tenuous purchase that enslaved Africans continue to have on what one might call with only a bit of winking, manhood. 
Giorgio Agamben writes that man can be human only to the degree that he transcends and transforms the anthropophorous animal which supports him, and only because through the act of negation he is capable of mastering and eventually destroying his own animality. The strange neologism anthropophorous, A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-P-H-O-R-O-U-S, which I assume means man-bearing, um, <laughs> though I couldn't, I, it's not in any dictionary anywhere. Um, <laughs> I assume, I assume. Um, holds one attention, holds one's attention. Agamba names the man-bearing animal, a creature that though proximate to and intimate with man should never be seen or hailed. To do so would risk revealing the obvious lie of a fundamental distinction between man and man-bearer. It would disrupt the action of negation, that the pursuit of mastery and destruction that Agamben suggests as a primary engine of modern society. While I am convinced by Agamben's arguments, I also find myself fretting about the targets and modes of his address. Spectral figure of a profoundly flawed articulation of modernity or not, Man stands as the undisputed subject of these sentences. Man exists, he transcends and transforms, masters and destroys. It seems, in fact, that man's never-ending attempts to confront and destroy anthropophorous animality sponsor the flexibility, creativity, and vigor necessary for man's ever-proliferating creative projects. In contrast, the anthropophorous animal itself does, not, does only one thing, it supports. I'm certain that you have guessed already that part of what irritates me most about Agamben, disturbs me most about Agamben, is that he seems incapable of moving his analysis between the philosophical and the historical. The anthropophorous animal is not an imaginary creature. Instead, I believe that the man-bearer is nothing more exotic than the African slave. This is though neither Mr. Agamben, nor Mr. Heidegger, nor Mr. Levinas, nor Mr. Foucault, nor Mr. Derrida, nor Mr. Latour seems capable, there are many other people who could be out of here. <laughs> um, seems capable of breaking, the, and some misses, or misses, misses and misses, capable of, <laughs> of breaking the hold of philosophical tradition long enough to fully consider this fact. I would suggest to you, however, that if we were to encourage the radical potentiality of Paul Gorey's articulation of the Black Atlantic, then we need to reconsider who and what counts as a proper subject within our various inquiries. Um, I've indicated already that I think that we have gone as far as we can with consideration of the lives and creations of traditionally established intellectuals, black or otherwise. I will add to this that so-called black intellectuals are a tiny minority of the individuals of African descent who have crossed the Atlantic. That is to say, slaves, soldiers, immigrants, refugees, and migrant laters, including, importantly for me, sex workers, are woefully underrepresented within Atlantic studies, largely due, I believe, to the fact that our disciplines have only a limited ability to recognize, recognize the modes of their articulation, the forms of their elocution. Or perhaps this is just another way of saying that these decidedly mixed subjects are just too difficult and inexplic inexplicable, too polluted and impure to, again, borrow Gilroy's language, to hold our attention. My specific charge to scholars of literature and culture, then, is not that we discontinue our reading of novels and poems, but that we read them better, much better. Um, those of us who are seriously involved in advancing Gilroy's arguments have mountains of work to do in order to disrupt the um, decidedly Anglo and androcentric analyses that have followed in his, in his wake and that support so much of what we do. In attempting to hurry myself along in this process, I remain mindful that though the ship as a living microcosm of modernity was and is a potent liberating idea for an entire generation of scholars, it was also an image that came front-loaded with fantastic notions of men alone at sea. Mm. In response, I believe that we ought to be much more detailed in our discussions of shipping and sailing as key technologies of the modern. In this sense, I'm overjoyed by the recent work of Marcus Redeker and Stephanie Smallwood on slave ships and the mechanics of the Atlantic Passage. Even more important, however, I'm convinced that in our efforts to reinvigorate consideration of the anthropophorous subject who literally bears the Atlantic project, we'd be, we would be wise to broaden our list of locations available to us for consideration. Most specifically, 
we need to restructure our thinking to consider how female subjects, most specifically in these comments, consider how female subjects directly participate in, Atlantic, in the Atlantic project, not as exceptional individuals, but through everyday practices that are difficult to see within traditional modes of literary criticism. Within the tradition of African American literature, there exists a stunningly consistent story of shock given to us by male intellectuals as they encounter prostitutes, houses of prostitution, and readily available women of questionable morals in their travels. Arriving at the West African seaport of Sekondi, Langston Hughes noted a brisk traffic in young African girls. Quote, in front of one hut, three white sailors from a British ship were bargaining with an old woman. Behind her, frightened and, estate and ashamed, stood a small girl, said to be a virgin. The price was four pounds. The sailors argued for a cheaper rate. They hadn't that much money. He continues telling us that later that night, as the ship remained anchored off the coast, two girls, petite ladies of the evening, rowed a small boat out to his ship. One of them was taken by the bosun to his private captain. The other was left in the quarters of the crew. She lay there naked and held up her hands. The girl said, moan me, but nobody had any money. 30 men crowded around, mostly in their underwear, sat up on bunks, watched, smoked, yelled, and joked, and waited for their turn. Each time a man would rise, the little African girl on the floor would say, Moni, Moni, but nobody had a cent. Yet they wouldn't let her get up. Finally, I couldn't bear to hear her crying Moni anymore, so I went to bed, but the festival went on all night. Though Hughes never bothers to say so, it is obvious that what haunts this scene is the specter of the Middle Passage. The multiracial crew, the naked African girl, were lost atop the aloofness and profundity of the Atlantic. Their revelry, a type of theater, a ritualized evocation of a never quite palpable certainty. What I would suggest here, however, is that prostitutes appear with such frequency in both the Big C, these are Langston Hughes's autobiographies, memoirs, and I wonder as I wander because Hughes recognized that they stood not at the periphery of modern society, but at its dead, dark center. That is to say, I see a fairly straightforward line of development between the anthropophorous animal, the slave, and the prostitute. What I will leave you with then is that in the articulation of Atlantic studies, one of the first things that must be jettisoned is any over-reliance on notions of an heroic subjectivity. The personnel, whom we've, we much, the personnel with whom we must concern ourselves are often defeated. They existed and exist at those locations thought to be outside of society. They were, in fact, benighted. They were dirty and impure. They were never more eloquent than when they were saying, Moni. As we work to memorialize Gilroy's, Paul Gilroy's great achievement in the Black Atlantic, part of what we have to ask ourselves as progressive critics is whether we are as committed to giving up on cultural nationalism as we claim to be. To do so involves not simply throwing out old-fashioned con concepts of cultural pr peculiarity, but also the very triumphalist narratives that have fueled so much within both American and African American studies. Thank you. I wasn't, shall I come here? <laughs> I'm scared now. This is intimidating. I I wasn't planning to say anything this evening because I know I was going to get my chance to speak tomorrow. But I just want to say that I have never got over the novelty of being taken seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and to be taken this seriously I, I don't know what to say except thank you, actually. And um, I mean, this trespasses over a little bit into what I wanted to say tomorrow. But I want I, saying it twice is OK. <laughs> and there are a number of other people in this room that make me want to say it now, too. This has never been about, for me, um, 
you know, an exercise in uh, private intellectual property. It's always been an open source project. It was one before I knew that one could think in quite that way. And I think it's, it's the sense of that open source project that makes it vitally important in the context of a kind of privatization of experience uh, and a privatization of, of scholarly practice. And so tonight for me, listening to you all is an affirmation that there are other ways of doing that work. Mm. And I, I don't know if that seems like a novelty or, or a banality in the context of the kind of training that people who do their PhDs receive now. But um, for me, this what I heard was a, uh, an affirmation of a kind of curiosity and openness that belongs in that sense of a shared labor. And I'm just really, really humbled by it. I don't know what to say except thank you. Thank <laughs> you.